so I thought I'd go through NBI and, and um, I guess, uh, a respiratory physician's perspective. This is my disclosure. I often present <laughs> at surgical conferences. Um, sometimes I wish I'd done surgical training, but I don't think I could put up with the on-calls now, so I'll, I'll probably stick to being a physician. So I might uh, go through uh, central airways lung cancer, uh, natural history and, and treatment, role uh, autofluorescence and NBI. Um, heading neck cancers and the risk of a second primary cancer, which was uh, uh, just discussed now. Uh, my experience in Brisbane and, and now in Adelaide. And um, if we have time, uh, there was a, a study that Dave has concocted up, um, uh, which we hope to join. And uh, I told him that I was seeing Camille uh, uh, this week. So he said, oh, you should try to get Camille on board if, if he's interested uh, in WA. We just need to find a respiratory physician in WA to join us. So for uh, SECs of the lung, um, essentially it's the same type of cell, obviously. Uh, we're, we're, show, we're seeing that in Australia, at least, the, the rate of this is dropping off because of decreasing smoking rates. And, and thankfully, in Australia now, smoking rates are, are down to under 15% uh, on the last few surveys. Um, in doctors, it's about 1%, I heard. So uh, we, we, we're lower than the general population, which is to be expected. Uh, most of these cancers are central um, and they're thought to develop from pre-neoplastic lesions, which I'm sure you've discussed already. And the, the grading system essentially is exactly the same as for the head and neck. Now, in bronchial dysplasias and carcinoma in situ, uh, the follow-up duration in the papers have, have generally been between sort of six months and, and four and a half years. Now, carcinoma in situ studies uh, have shown progression in up to about two-thirds of patients and they're very high risk of being persistent. So, the recommendation usually is for, for these to be, to be treated. Uh, severe dysplasia in the bronchus, about a third will persist to progress. Um, the rate of progression is up to about a third, and the rate of persistence is, again, approximately one third as well. Moderate mild dysplasia is a lower risk in the bronchus. So the risks include previous lung cancer, uh, previous uh, aerodigestive uh, tract cancers, and this reflects the field change effect, which I'm sure you've uh, uh, talked about today. Now in the lung, the lesions are often quite small. Um, so sometimes they regress because when you've taken a biopsy, you've taken the whole thing out. <laughs> and then the next time you go back to, to repeat the biopsy, there's, there's nothing there. Um, so that's, that, that can ha happen in the bronchus. So the recommendations, CIS, immediate treatment, severe dysplasia, follow-up bronchoscopy at three months, and then treatment if there's persistence at three months. A mild and moderate dysplasia, follow-up bronchoscopy at about one to two years. So the treatment modalities we have are, are similar. Um, diathermy, uh, we use a lot of APC, actually. Um, cryotherapy's um, got a lot of uh, uptake at the moment, and PDT is not, not routinely done uh, in Australia, at least in the respiratory setting. Uh, laser is very effective, but uh, because of the depth of penetration, there's always that risk of airway perforation. And if the lesion uh, has uh, gone beyond a certain depth, then you may need to look at more radical treatments such as radiotherapy or surgery. Now, the way that we assess that is um, usually with uh, ultrasound in the bronchus. Um, now, when, when they first developed endobronchial ultrasound uh, to look at masses and, and lymph nodes, uh, it wasn't miniaturised yet, so you had a little spinning ultrasound and you blew up a balloon and you placed the balloon where you thought the lymph node was, take a mental picture in your head where the node was, take the balloon out and then stick your needle in afterwards blind. But now it's all sort of real time, you know, the scopes are about six millimetres, the ultrasound's on the end, you see it in real time and you puncture in real time. But that uh, first type of ultrasound proved to be quite useful in looking at the depth of uh, cartilage penetration in the bronchus. So there are five distinct layers, and there was a very small paper um, published by Measley, but it's often uh, referenced quite a lot, where they used a balloon to look at the cartilaginous layers um, uh, in the bronchus. And if it hadn't penetrated past the fifth cartilaginous layer, then um, uh, direct therapies such as APC or cautery or, or other treatments such as that would, would, would work. And we demonstrated this in quite a few cases that we had of carcinoma in situ. We used uh, the, the balloon to, to look at the depth assessment. Um, the, the brown vessel was at the floor of the right upper lobe there. And this patient ended up having radiotherapy. And you could see afterwards at post assessment that the fifth layer was um, uh, visible again. So there was no evidence of recurrence. And she, she ended up doing quite well. Um, same issues in the lung, uh, difficult with white light bronchoscopy. Um, 
Apparently some data says we missed 70% of them just under white light. So fluorescence was developed initially, and that was in the early 90s. Um, fluorescence uh, is due to chromophores, elastin, collagen, flavins. Um, and in normal tissue, fluoresces green, and then as it uh, becomes abnormal, then um, uh, it, it loses that fluorescence. So as it progresses through the um, chain of uh, metaplasia through to carcinoma in situ, there's loss of that green signal and reduction in chromophores, increasing angiogenesis, which we know about, thickened epithelium, um, they all cause that fluorescence to change. And the colour usually depends on um, the wavelength or the uh, CCD sensor that the companies have developed. So the very first ones were the Oncolife and they were red. We used the DAF in, in uh, Brisbane and that was purple. Now these companies have sort of uh, exited Australia because uh, there weren't many uh, physicians taking it up. Um, so I, I don't think there's many uh, fluorescence uh, scopes left uh, in Australia. But that did show that um, uh, for severe dysplasias and carcinoma sites, uh, it was very useful in detecting these lesions. Now um, inflammatory changes, previous biopsy sites, previous treatments such as diathermy can cause a false positive rate um, with this technology. So it's very sensitive, but you can have quite a high false positive rate. This is one of our head and neck uh, examples. Um, I was a different type of respiratory physician. I attended all the head and neck meetings in, in Brisbane. And uh, I think when the uptake of fluorescence and NBI was still uh, early, um, they often sent those patients uh, to me to, to examine. So I'd do the head and neck and then do the bronchus at the same time as part of our research project. And this is a, a fluorescence um, intense uh, lesion at the, the front of the uh, anterior commissure. But you can see there's a bit of fluorescence on the, on the, on the right cord as well. And I'll come back to that example and show you what it looked like under narrowband afterwards. And it just shows that the narrowband is more specific. You've seen this, so I won't go through uh, this slide again. I think Theo went through the, um, how, how NBI works uh, earlier today. So the, there's, there's a few papers in the, in the bronchus. The one that's probably um, referenced the most is the Felix Hirth one in Germany, where they screened 60 patients and found 18 lesions of moderate dysplasia or worse. And it was a high specificity compared to fluorescence. Um, Kurumoto's done a few papers looking at uh, improving biopsy site selection and um, usually in the uh, recommendations from a thoracic uh, physician point of view, um, they say that the two technologies are complementary. Um, the combined system is available in Japan, but um, I don't believe it's available uh, anywhere else uh, in the world at the moment. So I. I always say to my registrars, you know, you should probably read the manual of the equipment that, that you're using. So I, I like to know uh, what tools we have at our disposal. These are generally the ones that, that we have. Um, I think the very first ENFVQ, which was in Australia, we got our hands on it pretty early on um, as thoracic physicians uh, with the, with the uh, ear, nose and throat team in Brisbane. I think that was, you know, 2006, 2007. Um, the advantage we found with our bronchoscopes is that um, you've got that suction port. So you can cheat a bit, you can throw a bit of local anaesthetic down, the patients uh, settle down a bit more, we can give a bit of sedation at the same time, and you've got a bit more time to examine the upper airways. And now the scopes have, have slowly shrunk down, and the P190 is, is now down to a 4.2 uh, channel um, with a 2 millimeter working channel. Um, but that's not high definition. Um, one of my co-authors, uh, uh, Brent Masters, did a PhD where he uh, looked at what was the examination, uh, what was the magnification of a bronchoscope, and he had to manually measure that because I think the Olympus IP wouldn't wouldn't tell wouldn't tell him at the time. But at about four millimeters, um, you get about a thirty uh, times magnification. But that that's not high definition. Um, so the one that's a little bit bigger uh, with a similar working channel uh, in the bronchus, at least, is high definition. Is the H190. So you still got that working channel. And then the FATO scope, which we call the therapeutic scope, um, has a nice uh, big working channel and, uh, and high definition. And that works quite well um, uh, in uh, the bronchus when you have to do therapeutic uh, interventions. And that's usually the one we use for our balloon dilatations for our idiopathic tracheal stenosis patients and our laser and stents and APCs, etc. So we can't come back to this um, uh, case, and we found that most of the abnormality was at the anterior commissure. So this is a very early model um, uh, uh, bronchoscope with, with NBI, it was the, the 180 series, so it still wasn't high definition, but you still got a very nice um, picture of the abnormality. And you can see the, 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 uh, the um, fluorescence on, on the right cord there uh, was actually a false, false positive. The patient had previously had radiotherapy to that area, and that was what was bringing up the fluorescence.
This is usually one of our classic bronchus examples. This is a, a man with a larynx, head and neck, and we, we performed a uh, fluorescence bronch first. You can see the uh, purple uh, intense area just at the lower lobe, uh, apical segment here, and then lower lobe basal segments. And he also had quite an intense um, fluorescence uptake in the, the right upper lobe, just here. And when you switch to NBI, you can um, usually see the, the PIC patterns or the IPCLs um, and target your biopsies. So these were all moderate or severe dysplasias which we, which we followed. So even in the early technology, the, the 180 series, we, we were getting quite, quite nice images um, when we were examining these patients. And that's the white light. It's quite diffusely red, but then the NBI tells you exactly where you should be um, targeting your forceps. You know, the, the intense uh, erythema there on that scar may not have given you the same answer. So uh, we find it quite useful in the bronchus. So that was a severe dysplasia. So the American College of Chest Physician Guidelines uh, basically have uh, recommended this. They, they were a bit less um, forthright in, in the, uh, I guess, the NBI recommendations because um, the papers were still coming out in 2013, but basically you can substitute fluorescence for NBI now, I think, and that will probably be what happens when they bring out the next set of guidelines. So severe dysplasia or carcinoma in situ, um, uh, on uh, sputum you should probably do a, at least a white light bronchoscopy, but if not that, then um, fluorescence or NBI if you have uh, access to it. We, we have sometimes used um, narrowband imaging to uh, detect the um, uh, proximal extent of uh, central tumours because if they're more than, or if they're less than two centimetres to the crina, then uh, uh, surgery is usually off the, off the card. So we, we have used that uh, in terms of our surgical assessment as well. Did you go through this paper? You have. <laughs> so this was, I'm, I'm more a clinician. I, I, don't do the clever stuff that uh, Prof Farrow does, so all the genes and stuff I, I didn't really understand, but I do remember in the genetic paper that he, he published um, uh, going to theatre with Martin Batstone and you know, the surgical specimen would come out and then I'd, I'd take my three pieces and then put them in, uh, put them in uh, RNA and then run back to the lab and put them in the freezer. So that was, that was my, my role uh, during that paper. But that was a, very nice to see that come out a couple of years after the, the PhD was finished. So that was a really good results to see. But this was the, the clinical paper that preceded it. Um, and we, we uh, used uh, fluorescence and narrowband um, to look at both the head and neck and the, the uh, bronchus. And the equipment was, the, the, at the time, the 180 series uh, Olympus uh, NBI scopes. And we graded them as a, a one, two, three. You know, these gradings may have uh, had some evolution since then, which uh, we, we heard before. So by, uh, basically anything that was not normal, grade two or worse, by any imaging modality was biopsy. We didn't do a control uh, biopsy. That was one of the weaknesses of the paper. We did have dedicated pathologists for the, for the specimens. And anything moderate dysplasia or worse, we, we labelled as significant for statistics. Now the, the statistics which you've probably already heard about narrowband is essentially that it's um, uh, more specific. So I'm, I might um, just show what I find is the most useful thing. It's the impact it has on clinical management, I think. Um, and in, in this set of uh, uh, patients, there was about 11 patients where the clinical management changed based purely on the uh, narrowband findings that we had from uh, our examination. So these were the uh, breakdown of, of patients, 47 sort of primary sites. There were 10 who had an unknown primary origin, um, and 16 had a previous uh, head and neck cancer and had, were sent back for reassessment because of clinical concern. Um, the take home for this was the specificity of fluorescence was fairly low in this series, and I think that was probably impacted by the fact those 16 patients who'd had previous treatment um, had uh, false, false positive. Um, and that's probably influenced the results in this paper. In the bronchus, uh, uh, as expected, narrowband was more specific again. And um, this is uh, available uh, on, online or via PDF if you, you want to copy, but um, these are the patients where management uh, was, was changed. 
And what I found was that having that flexible scope and being able to have a good look at the cores and the commissure was often quite helpful for um, the head and neck team. Um, so the seeing extra extension either into the subglottic region or seeing that the anterior commissure was clear often uh, impacted management. So the, the first case there, they changed from laser to, to uh, laryngectomy actually because of tumour extension and that was confirmed on uh, surgical resection. Uh, one, another one, plan laser resection, again, further extension was detected by narrowband, so that was changed to, to radiotherapy. And, and those were the, were the pattern of things that we saw. It's really useful, I guess, in the larynx and, and uh, uh, that type of region. The best one, I think, was probably the number five, the unknown primary. That was, I think, our first case and really helped to um, I impact, I think, the, at least the Brisbane experience on narrowband. It really convinced them that this was a, a technology that they should probably use. And I'll show, I'll show that video um, uh, for the crowd. So this was the, I think, the very first case we sort of did with the NFVQ. Um, it was sent to me after a uh, ENT surgeon, uh, well, actually the chair of the head and neck meeting, um, couldn't find the, the primary site. And under white light, um, this is the right piriform fossa and under narrowband, it was just, I don't know, it, it was very, um, it stuck out to us and after you know, we saw that once, it just really helped to uh, confirm uh, the usefulness of this, but also uh, helped us to, to learn what to look for uh, when using narrowband examination. So we, we saved this video, saved photos, uh, he took it to theatre and then uh, resected this, this primary site out and, and got clear margins. So my Adelaide experience, um, I find the ENT team just as supportive. Um, we, we have complex airways MDTs and have done plenty of uh, procedures together. Sometimes on Boxing Day, is that right, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even when we're not on call. So um, uh, at the moment, the, 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 the voice clinics and, and the uh, local expertise is, is excellent. So uh, yeah, I don't have as many patients now that are sent to me for upper airways NBI input. Um, and really, really my role is to talk to respiratory physicians and say, look, you're there, you're, you're throwing local anaesthetic on the cords. You know, it takes sort of one click of the button to have a quick look around the, uh, the larynx because if they've got a lung cancer, they might also have a head and neck. So that's usually what my um, role is now in terms of, of, of training the, the, the younger doctors. But um, that you know, is a simple thing that takes two, you know, two or three minutes to do while you're waiting for the local anaesthetic to work on the cords uh, to have a careful look around. So some of the cases I've done, um, I'm a strange respiratory physician, I, I biopsy the upper airway stuff, but usually I ask uh, the ear, nose and throat people if they're okay for me to do that first. Um, again, as I said, Brisbane and Adelaide people have been pretty supportive. This is a, a case that I share with one of the ENT consultants in Adelaide, and um, this was a, the first bronchoscopy where we took some biopsies, and uh, then later, because of some extension at the anterior commissure, we, we uh, co-manage um, that patient with um, some blazer just below the vocal cords. So we're still following him up together. We've, uh, this is a slide I've sort of kept in my NBI talks and we've already heard about high definition. I think that's going, that's uh, you know, a, a great role um, in this region. Uh, OCT has, uh, in the lung at least, um, has probably uh, sort of hit a plateau, it's, it's, it's still in research, um, but um, it's, it hasn't taken off as, as quickly as we expected. Um, there are a couple of Adelaide uh, researchers at the SAMRI and also at the University of Adelaide who, who have quite a lot of expertise in them, in them, and one of them was from WA who's, who's moved over, so we're hoping to perhaps look at a potential role for that in peripheral lesions at least. Uh, confocal, um, the initial stuff was, was quite chunky, so it's, it's taken a while for the technology to shrink it down. Um, but there's a few people in France and Europe who are investigating that in, in the bronchus at least. Uh, volatile uh, organic compounds, uh, breath tests, we were quite keen on this, uh, but um, I haven't seen too much data on that lately. And endocytoscopy, uh, some of our gastroenterologists in Adelaide use that. So we had time, I could probably go through um, this, this uh, outline of a future research collab collaboration. Theo, is that two minutes? All right. Um, so David Fielding, he, he wants to look at head and neck cancer surveillance at three to five years post-curative treatment using a single NBI procedure and a CT chest with computer-aided diagnostics to look for lung nodules. 
in the background there, we've heard um, there's a risk of um, uh, a second primary, and uh, a, a lot of them are actually in the in the lung, and the larynx primaries are the highest risk. Again, other papers showing that uh, bronchus cancers can follow head and neck cancers. These papers back then didn't use CT routinely, usually used symptoms and x-ray, so often the lung cancers were late to find. Um, I believe this is being covered tomorrow, surveillance strategies, but one of the things we found was the surveillance strategies were variable between centres. So our question is, can NBI improve the yield of prenatal plastic versus invasive second primary disease compared to historic series? Can it help improve the detection of mucosal tumours compared to conventional uh, examination? And does the presence of emphysema on, on lung function predict even a high risk of second uh, uh, cancers, either in the larynx or the hyperpharynx group? Because it has been shown to, to be like that in the lung. So we're looking at thinking of looking at patients at three to five years post curative intent. Um, if they've ever had a bronchoscopy after the original diagnosis, then we want to exclude them to treat it as a true incidence uh, study. Now, this criteria is still up for debate. If they've had a CT chest within the last two years, I think David wants to exclude them. Um, but um, we're not sure if that may affect recruitment as an exclusion criteria. So all patients to get white light and narrow band examination, um, get lung function, get a low dose CT chest as part of lung cancer screening, and there's data on that to back that up using a computer-added diagnostics to help with nodule assessment. These, this would be the grading system one through to four, um, where four is gross visible tumour, and we'd like to have an ENT surgeon up, uh, present for the upper airway stuff, not to, uh, well, to double check that we haven't missed anything after we've done our examination. I think that's important to have an expert in that area, uh, back up the head and neck side of things. And then we'd biopsy all three class three and four cases, a biopsy at least one control area and then grade them as, as per usual. So that, that's sort of the plan in progress. I think David uh, had a different project which took up a bit of his time, so he hasn't had time to, to get that up and running yet, but um, he's pretty keen to, to get that started again. I thought I'd just throw that little bit out there um, uh, as a potential study which we could do across perhaps two or three states. Mm -hmm.